Well, good morning. morning. Welcome to Central Presbyterian Church, where we seek the transformation of our lives, our community, and the world through the renewing work of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. My name is Charles Godwin, and I am one of the pastors here. Today, we are continuing our sermon series, Life in the Kingdom, a study of 1 Peter. Throughout this letter, Peter has taught us about the struggles of suffering that go along with living as exiles in this world. That's who the Christians were who were receiving this letter. They were scattered throughout the Roman Empire and facing persecution. And that's who we are too. Now, we may not face intense persecution in those ways like they did, although some followers of Christ do in this world. Nevertheless, this is not our final destination. It is not our home, and it should not feel like it. Because the readers, both the original ones and we, are aliens and strangers in this world, they and we need hope. And Peter gives it to us today as he writes in our text about living our lives of faith in Christ. So let me pray for us, and then we'll read the scriptures. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of the living God, we pray that you would give us soft hearts, help us not to harden our hearts, and help us to see Jesus as our only hope. And we pray in his name. Amen. Our text is 1 Peter chapter 4. We'll be reading the first six verses of this chapter. If you're using the Pew Bible, you can find that on page 1016. This is God's Word. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to these, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Recently, Pam and I had the privilege of visiting the Netherlands for a couple of weeks. It was a wonderful trip. While in the city of Maastricht in the southern part of the Netherlands, near the borders of Belgium and Germany, we toured some caves. Now, it was an extensive network of underground caves that extended from the Netherlands into Belgium. And they actually were used to hide refugees during World War II and to secretly travel between the two countries as well. Well, I'll tell you this. You would not want to go through these caves without a guide. In fact, you're not allowed to do so. But if you did, you would more than likely get lost, be trapped underground, and probably not rescued. I felt a little that way, trapped, when we went in with our group and all of a sudden the guide closed this big steel door behind us. I especially felt trapped, stuck even, when he encouraged us to turn off our lights and to feel our way along the walls for a period of time. Stuck, trapped, apart from Christ, the Bible says that's our story. Stuck, trapped in our sin and brokenness. And everyone here is sinful and broken. We all are. In fact, everything we say, do, or think is laced with sin and brokenness in some way. 
The Bible says even the things we may think are good, filthy rags, apart from Christ, trapped, stuck in our sin and brokenness, the only freedom we have apart from Christ is freedom to sin. But if we're trusting in Jesus as our only hope in life and death, then friends, we also are free to choose not to sin. And this is the life of faith that Peter describes in our text today. It is a life of freedom not to sin. There is liberty in our salvation. Liberty, liberty, what word was that that came out? Liberty from being trapped or stuck in our sin and brokenness. This life of faith Peter describes may bring suffering. It more than likely will. But we are not without hope because of Christ. Now, he is more than a guide to our rescue. He is our actual rescuer. Pastor Cole reminded us last week that Christ has suffered and died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. One scholar described Jesus' suffering for us in this way, quote, Jesus fully embraced his calling to suffer out of his desire to save us. And in today's text, Peter tells us since Christ therefore has suffered in the flesh, we are free to live that way too, to die to sin, to die in the flesh, and to live to righteousness, being made alive in the spirit. It's not out of compulsion or duty, but it's out of joy and gratitude. So this morning, we're going to talk about the life of faith in Christ that Peter describes, and then we'll talk about how we live that life. First, let's look at what Peter has to say about our lives of faith in Christ, beginning in verse 1. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Peter writes about our lives of faith in Christ that we have ceased from sin. This cannot mean that we have completely stopped sinning because that would contradict a lot of what the Bible teaches. So what does it mean? It means, as one pastor said, that when we identify ourselves with Christ in Christ, there's a break that happens with sin globally. It means that Christ, by his sacrificial death on the cross, has broken sin's power over us. So now, in him, we are free to choose not to sin. We don't always do it but we're free to choose not to sin. One scholar wrote about this statement of Peter saying we have ceased from sin. He says, it's as if Peter barks out, enough already, put sin in the rearview mirror. I read the story of Augustine's conversion. One day he was actually reading this text, and particularly verse 3 in that long list of sins. And his heart was stricken because he recognized himself. And he said this, I have made every provision I could to fulfill the lusts of my flesh. I need to change my clothes. God grant that he would dress me in the clothes of Christ, that I may no longer make provision for the lust of my flesh. And that's what Peter is saying here. I heard a parable um, from philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, and it's about the disastrous effects of not putting to death the desires of sin and the flesh. So here's the parable. There's this group of ducks one spring, and they are flying northward across Europe. And during the flight, one duck came down into a barnyard where there were tame ducks. He enjoyed some of their corn. He stayed for an hour, 
and then for a day. A week passed, and before he knew it, a month had gone by. He loved that good food, so he stayed all summer long. Then the fall came, and his same friends of wild ducks were flying southward again. They passed overhead, and the duck on the ground heard their cries. He was filled with this strange thrill and joy. He desired to fly with them again, and so he started flapping his wings, and he rose in the air about as high as the barn (laughs) and fell back into the barnyard because he was so soft and heavy from the good fare he had been enjoying. He said to himself, oh, well, my life is safe here, and the food is good. So every spring and every autumn when he heard his friends flying over, his eyes would gleam for a moment and he would begin flapping his wings. But finally the day came when the wild ducks flew overhead uttering their cries and he paid no attention. In fact, he failed to hear them at all. The writer telling the story went on to say, what an apt parable for the church in our time. Many of us have feasted far too long on the pleasant fare the world has to offer. We too easily forget that the time past was enough. We forget that we are still far from home. We're aliens and strangers. We haven't arrived at our destination yet. Sadly, many go on day by day unfazed by the gospel. That as we feed on the husk of this world we demonstrate that we think too little of the delights that await us in heaven. Peter says enough. Have done with these lesser things. I was studying this week and I thought that this text reminds me of Paul's words to the Romans when he says this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Those apart from Christ, relying on their own works, are only free to sin. They are trapped by it and in it. But because Christ has rescued us, we're not trapped anymore. One scholar said it this way for those in Christ. He said, sin's not the boss of us. Grace compels us not to sin. Peter's not teaching that Christians now are perfect or that sin is no longer a problem. Indeed, he writes to urge Christians to forsake sin. Yet there is a decisive difference. They have died to sin and have gained the freedom to live according to the will of God. Their lives are different. And so we strive to live for the will of God, to put on the new man, to exalt Christ and make him known by the way we love others and do good, by the way that Peter has taught us that we submit to difficult people and sometimes ungodly people in authority. Living however you want to live is not true freedom. Living for the will of God, seeking to obey the things he tells us are loving and good is what brings restoration and joy, and blessing. We don't live this way. In order to gain God's acceptance, we already have it in Jesus Christ. It is true that we are no longer under the law as a means of acceptance with God, but we are still to see the law as a means of living for God. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And listen at this, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free free. And the Apostle James describes God's law as perfect, the law of liberty. I like this explanation of the truth that I read recently. The author said, the Bible is the owner's manual of your soul. Its instructions are good. Sometimes they don't seem good, 
Sometimes they don't seem like a law of liberty, but they are in this way. Look at the fish. How free will a fish feel after an hour on the land? If you restrict a fish to water, it has life. Unfortunately, our culture often defines freedom as the absence of restrictions. The law is a source of liberty. It does limit our freedom, but in good ways, like this. The law against false witness forbids that we say whatever we please when we, whenever we please. But truth-telling also gives freedom. If children tell the truth, it grants their parents freedom to trust them. Also, we thrive when we rest and reflect one day a week instead of toiling and rushing day after day. And the list could go on. Living our lives of faith in this way that Peter describes, it is a challenge. It can feel like a fight. We're convicted of our sins by the power of the Holy Spirit. We repent of our sins. Then by the power of the Spirit and faith, we, le- we seek Jesus as our only hope and we seek to live for the will of God. In fact, we fight to live for it, putting off sin, putting on righteousness. And it's not easy because of this thing called indwelling sin. As Paul writes, we don't do what we want to do and we do what we don't want to do. But we're not without hope because of Christ. And because in Christ, we also have something else that's indwelling, the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on to write, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, here's this promise, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's not easy When we push back against the brokenness and darkness in us in this world, that darkness and brokenness, even though it doesn't have the ultimate victory, it is still strong. It will push back against us. We will fail at times. And so we hear the saving word of Jesus again. We repent and believe and we try and fight all over again by the Spirit in us. And as you seek to live your lives in this way, Peter writes in verse 4 that others may be surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they may malign you. We know the Christians that Peter wrote this letter to were. They were maligned. And we may be also. R.C. Sproul tells a story when Billy Graham was invited to play golf with President Ford and two PGA Tour professionals. He writes this. He says, After the round of golf was finished... One of the other pros came up to one of the other pros who played and said, Hey, what was it like playing with the president and Billy Graham? The pro began to unleash a torrent of cursing. And in a disgusted manner, he said, I don't need Billy Graham stuffing his faith down my throat. With that, he turned on his heel. He stormed off to the practice tee and began wailing on the balls. His friend followed him and sat on the bench and watched And after a few minutes of anger, the pro was spent. He sat down by his friend, and his friend asked quietly, was Billy a little rough on you out there? The pro heaved an embarrassed sigh and said, no, he didn't even mention his faith. I just had a bad round. Sproul concludes, Billy Graham is so identified with faith, so identified with the things of God, that his very presence was enough to make this man feel like the hound of heaven was breathing down his neck. He felt crowded by holiness, even if it is only made present by an imperfect, partially sanctified Billy Graham. Peter writes here of the freedom we have in Christ to die to sin, to die in the flesh, and live to righteousness, being made alive in the Spirit. And it's not out of compulsion or duty, but it's out of joy and gratitude. Now let's talk about how we live this life of faith, Peter describes. He tells us in verses 1 and 2, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. Arm yourself 
with the same way of thinking. Actually, the language with this way of thinking is more simply translated with this thought. So arm yourself with this thought. What is the thought about Christ's suffering in the flesh with which we are to arm ourselves as we live our lives of faith? The word therefore gives us a clue. Remember a few weeks ago, Clay said when we see the word therefore, we ask the question, what is the therefore there for? It bids us to remember what we studied in chapter 3 of this letter. That Christ suffered and died, here's a key word, once for sins. The righteous for the unrighteous that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. When you arm yourselves, you are to remember who you were. Dead in your sins and brokenness. But in Christ, now who you are. Beloved, rescued, not because of what you've done or not done, but because of what he's done for you. You are to arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. What Christ has done once as the final sacrifice by dying the death you deserve on the cross is enough to forgive you for your sins and to make the broken in you and this world unbroken. He's paid it all. Your sins are no longer held against you. Corey Timboon put it well when she said, God has taken our sin, he has thrown it into the sea of forgetfulness, and he has posted a sign that says, no fishing allowed. We already stated that to live like this is a challenge. I read in one sense D-Day. You know D-Day. D-Day has already taken place. Historians say that when the Allies landed in Normandy in June of 1944, it marked the beginning of the end of World War II. Yet still to come was the Battle of the Bulge, one of the bloodiest battles of World War II when the forces of the Third Reich made their final struggle. The writer goes on, Our conversion, our coming to faith in Jesus is like D-Day. The outcome of our spiritual future is no longer in doubt. Yet tomorrow might begin for us the spiritual battle of the bulge. Even though these powers and principalities have been subdued by Jesus and dealt a mortal blow, they still seek to give us one final battle. To live our lives of faith, we need to arm ourselves with the truth that Christ has suffered and died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. I had a professor in seminary who I think modeled this for me and for a number of students. You may know him. His name's Philip Douglas. Um, And Dr. Douglas used to keep a list of gospel promises on the inside cover of his Bible that he would recite to himself every day. Bible verses like this, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And he saved us, not because of the righteous things done by us, but because of his mercy. And behold, what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And that is who we are, and so many more. Arm yourself with the same way of thinking. Tim Keller said, don't just believe it, arm yourself. There's a whole lot more to living the Christian life than just believing something. You may know God loves you and that his approval and his approval is all that you need. Yet when you face criticism or rejection, do you lash out? You may know God approves of you, but you haven't armed yourself with it. If you were armed with it, possibly you could respond positively. You may know God is powerful and wise, but if you're eaten up with worry, you may know he is wise and powerful, but you may not be armed with the thought. And then he goes on to give this example of owning a weapon for protection. And let's say you keep that weapon locked under key in your bedroom. And yet one evening you are surprisingly attacked in your living room. Well, that weapon is not going to do you much good under lock and key in the bedroom, is it? 
And then he asks, how are you meeting the circumstances of your life? With what truth? Do you use the gospel on yourself or not? The bad news is that I am more wicked and terrible and evil of a person than I ever dared believe. But the good news is that in Christ, I am more loved, cherished, and accepted than I dared ever hope. Are you regularly preaching that to yourself? Are you putting yourself in places where you can hear it and receive it? In God's word, in worship, with his people where you're both hearing the gospel and seeing the gospel and the sacraments that God has given us, spending time in community with his people where you're experiencing the gospel both in word and deed and just in presence? Are you armed with the gospel? It is a discipline. The way for you to want to have nothing to do for sin the way for you to hate your sin, the way for you to have sin lose all power over you, the way for you to have sin lose all the ability to attract you, the way for you to kill its power over you is to arm yourself with what Jesus did for you on the cross, with how much he loves you. It's not how much he can get you. Arm yourself with the fact that he said, I won't get you because I've died for you. We sing this song, the grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea. And I am safe on this solid ground. The Lord is my salvation. I will not fear when darkness falls. His strength will help me scale these walls. I'll see the dawn of the rising sun. The Lord is my salvation. My hope is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of his word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, you may feel yourself there today. In times of need, when I know loss, when I am weak, I know his grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. Who is like the Lord, our God? Strong to save, faithful in love. My debt is paid and the victory won. The Lord is my salvation. How do we live this life of faith that Peter describes? We arm ourselves with this thought that Christ has suffered and died once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. On June 23, 2018, 12 members of a soccer team ages 11 to 16 and their coach entered the Tom Luong Cave in northern Thailand after a practice session. Shortly after they began, the rains began, heavy rains, and they partially flooded the entrance to the cave system, blocking the team's way out and pushing them deep within. Efforts came to locate the group were hampered because of the strong currents and the rising water levels, and the team was without contact with anyone outside the cave for more than a week. The cave rescue expanded into this huge operation. People and rescue teams from all over the world. On July 2nd, after advancing through the narrow passages and muddy waters, British divers found the group. They were alive on an elevated rock over two and a half miles from the entrance of the cave. Rescue organizers discussed a lot of options of how to get them out of there. Maybe they would teach all these kids just basic underwater underwater diving skills and hope they could get their way out. Maybe they would wait till another entrance was found or an entrance was drilled or for the monsoon to subside several months later. After days of pumping water from the system and a respite from the rainfall, rescue teams worked quickly to extract them from the cave before the next rain, which was expected to bring many additional inches of rain on July 11. So between July 8 and 10, all 12 boys and their coach were rescued from the cave by an international team that included as many as 10,000 people. Those players would have died without rescue. We are like those soccer players. 
trapped and stuck in our sin. Death would be our story if we were not rescued by Jesus. But if you are in Christ, you have been rescued to a life of freedom to die to sin and live to righteousness. You have been rescued by Jesus and delivered from the kingdom of darkness out of that cave and brought into the kingdom of light. You may suffer now as you seek to live for the will of God, but suffering and death is not the end of our story. It doesn't have the last word. Notice what Peter says at the end of our text. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that those judge, that though judged in the flesh by the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Now this doesn't mean the gospel is preached to people after they've already physically died. It actually means that the gospel was preached before they died and then they died. And their hope, like our hope in Christ, is that we might live in the way the Spirit does. Peter says, we all will face our maker and judge one day and have to give account of our lives to him. And he reminds us of a sure hope in Christ that we might live in the Spirit the way God does. A sure hope that Edmund Clowney says holds the future in the present because it's anchored in the past. Our hope is not in this world, its people, or in anything it has to offer. Our hope is in Jesus, the one who has secured our future by his perfect life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. And he will come again and judge the living and the dead. And we in this world will be made new. What a wonderful future. There will be a day when there will be no more sin or brokenness or temptation or trials. Knowing how the story ends, what Christ has accomplished for you, that the curse you deserve, he took for you on the cross as a one-time-for-all act of free grace, that he's laid down his life for you, that the battle with sin and brokenness is over, the curse is ended. Arming this or yourself with this strengthens and enables you to live your life of faith question is, will you trust him today? I'd love to talk more with you about that if you want to do that. Pastor Taylor would, any of our other pastors would as well. Will you trust Jesus today? Since Christ has suffered and died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit. Friends, we are free to live that way too, to die to sin, to live to righteousness, not out of compulsion or duty, but out of joy and gratitude. May God give us grace. Let's pray. Holy Spirit of the living God, we prayed before we started here this morning that you would give us soft hearts and help us not to harden our hearts and help us to see Jesus We pray that you would continue that work in us. Help us to arm ourselves with what Jesus has done for us as we live our lives of faith. Thank you for your love in Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen.